a few weeks ago, we started a new series called Dressed for Success. And this series is looking at how God gives us a brand new wardrobe filled with all sorts of new garments that we are called to put on when we follow Jesus. And we're going to continue that theme today. And I'd like us to look together at Colossians chapter 3, which has been the key text for this series. And it says this in verse 12 onwards. Since God chose you. I haven't forgotten the words. I'm just wondering if anyone else picked up the weight of what I've just said there. Let me try again. Since God chose you. Pinch yourself and say, is that real? Yeah, ouch, not that hard. Is that for real? Was that in me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Since God chose you. You could dine out on those few words if there was nothing else in the Bible. If you never met another Christian, if you never heard another sermon, if you never experienced another worship time together, you could dine out on those words for the rest of your life. Since God chose you. If you have experienced rejection in your life, God has chosen you. If you're going through a tough time right now, God has chosen you. Since God has chosen us. That is the most incredible reality that you and I live with. And he's chosen us to step into some things. It says, since God has chose you to be the holy people he loves. Holy is a, another way of describing exclusive, dedicated, committed, excluding all others. There's not an ability in the, in the relationship we have with God to be partly in with God and partly out with God. That holiness is a devotedness to the Lord. Since we have been chosen by God to be his holy people. Exclusively is. God made a real careful statement to the people of God in the Old Testament, and it's continued as a theme throughout the New. That is, that I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the most dynamic relationship that you and I will ever, ever know. Since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, that's an important additional bit on there. He didn't choose you because he thought, okay, he's a good worker. He didn't choose you because he thought you were the best. He chose you because he loves you. And it says, now I want you to listen to this second word I'm about to give because it says, you must. That's a powerful word. Yeah. Must. Not should, not could, not would, not probably on balance. It's worth giving it a go. It says you must do something. You must clothe yourselves. Do we have anybody in the room this morning that someone else clothed you? Now, the nearest I get to that is that probably for the first 20 years of my marriage, um, I, I think I lost confidence about buying clothes by myself without Nina's opinion. I, I, I feel that her, I've assimilated her opinion now, and, um, and, and I can go and buy something but um, with confidence. But I still want to know what she thinks when I put it on. Does this look all right, Nina? But I'm 47 years of age now, I think. 48. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm 48 years of age. 
and I can clothe myself. Church, it's about time that the people of God grew up and started having confidence to clothe ourselves with the things that Christ has provided for us. He provides the clothes, we put them on. We get dressed. We clothe ourselves. And if there's a theme, I believe, for the body of Christ that runs throughout the Scriptures, it is the word maturity. It is that the fivefold ministry gifts of the pastors, the prophets, the evangelists, the apostles, and the teachers, they are given to equip the saints for works of service so they may become mature. Yeah. Mature people. And I quoted recently that someone who's written a series called The Emotionally Healthy Leader, The Emotionally Healthy Disciple, he makes this comment that so often people who have been Christians for 20 years are not 20-year-old Christians, they're one-year-old Christians 20 times. And they still require milk, they still require someone to get them dressed. But listen, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves. And there's some clothes he mentions. Some of these we've looked at already. We must clothe ourselves with tender-hearted mercy. And this is not self-help. Um, this is not just us trying better. This is us going to a wardrobe that salvation provides and saying, I'm doing away with my old wardrobe and I'm going to place myself in this, which is clothing myself with Christ. Tender-hearted mercy, that gut instinct mercy. Kindness. We looked at the importance of clothing ourselves with the kindness of Christ. And today we're going to look at humility. Previously in this series, we've looked at how what we wear, it projects something to the world around us. If you wear a policeman's outfit, it communicates authority. It communicates something of what that uniform represents. And when we clothe ourselves with Christ, it projects something to others. It also persuades something internally that if you are an off-duty police officer, you're the same person, you've had the same training, but not having the uniform on, it makes you less confident about standing in the middle of the road and saying, stop. Yeah. That what we wear, it projects and it persuades. And that persuasion is not just a temporary thing, it brings a transformation in our hearts and in our lives. We looked at how kindness is not a gentle fabric. It's a bold, strong, life-giving truth. And in 1 Peter 5, 5, it says this. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. All of you. It's good to honor all ages, isn't it? It's good to honor those in authority. But all of you, dress yourselves. Again, there's that theme. It's almost like the scripture is talking about clothes. Dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud. That is quite a powerful terminology there. He opposes. If you are dressing yourselves in the paraphernalia of pride, and we'll look at this in a moment, then it means that you are Pitching yourself against God. It says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humility changes everything. It changes how we listen, how we talk, how we act, and how we think. Humility determines if we build others up or we pull them down. Humility determines even how we worship. Now, humility has been in the news a bit over the last month. And as a Welsh missionary in England, I'm a bit loath to mention this, because I was supporting your football team last week. But there has been some writings in the press of one of the features of England football team's manager is that he is humble. It's been a word that's even been used in some headlines. 
And it seems like humility has been recognized as a lovely thing, as a good thing, as a strength in society. Now, that's, that ebbs and flows. Sometimes people want strong leaders and people who are single-minded and they don't listen to others. And there's all sorts of ebbs and flows on what society desires in leaders. But what God desires, not just in leaders, but in everybody, is humility. But let's look at some of the attributes of the England football manager before we look to the attributes of Christ. And I'm not making any joint connection there. But let me just try and dispel some stuff because humility doesn't take away your sense of drive or your ambition. The England manager clearly wanted to win. So his humility didn't numb his ability to be victorious. Um, his humility didn't dispel the significance of the job he had to do. He realized his role was significant. He realized that he had the opportunity to get, get it right or to get it wrong. But yet he was humble. He realized that the expectations of an entire nation were placed upon him. He realized that he was there not to be served as the England manager, but to serve the country. And that's a key point. C.S. Lewis, famous apologist and writer, said this, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. A gentleman called Thomas More said that humility is that low, sweet root from which all heavenly virtues shoot and grow. Someone else once said, and I could source them, but I won't because of the statements about to come out. He said, the proud man can learn humility, but he will be very proud of it. It's a bit of a quandary topic, humility. The Bible says that the most humble person that ever lived was Moses. And Moses wrote that. Humility is not an optional garment. It's not like a scarf that you put on and off. It's an absolute essential garment for the people of God. I want to ask the question, how do we wear humility? And the first thing I want to just lay as a foundation for how we wear humility is humility requires us to acknowledge God in everything. You remember C.S. Lewis's quote, it's not that we think less of ourselves, it's we think of ourselves less and the Apostle Paul put it this way, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. As John the Baptist was gathering thousands of people coming into the wilderness to be baptized, and he saw Jesus, he said, I must become less, he must become more. That it's that situation where we acknowledge God in everything. We acknowledge God in our mornings, in our afternoons, in our evenings, and our Mondays, and our Fridays, and our Wednesdays, not just our Sundays. We acknowledge God, and we realize that we exist to worship Him. Ephesians 1.12 says, In order that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. That's our objective. That's our, that's our destiny, is to make Him famous, is to extravagantly declare the goodness of God to this world. That's why we are here. It's not just to gather as churches and worship and to love him more. And we'll do all those things in eternity. But it is in a world that's largely rejected him, and we'll look at that in a moment. It is for us as the people of God to say there is no one like our God. There is no one like Jesus. Humility acknowledges God in everything. And it affects everything, even our worship. But before you can put humility on, there are some things we need to take off. And the Bible says a lot about pride, as I mentioned earlier on. We need to get undressed from the pride in our lives. We read in the book of Judges that there's this cycle that keeps happening. That the people of God, they, um, they live in blessing and they live in peace and 
their neighbors are, uh, they don't attack them, and it, all is well. And in that place of blessing, they forget God. And so, because they fail to acknowledge God in all of their ways and place Him as the center of their communities, it's almost like this protection over their life is lifted. And so, the neighbors begin to raid them, and they begin to enslave them, and they begin to make their conditions a burden, and they begin to ravage the land for all the goods. And the people of God, they remember God. And they get on their faces, and they cry out to God, and they say, God, rescue us. We're sorry we've left you out of our lives. And God raises up a deliverer, and a deliverer rescues them from the hands of the oppressors, brings liberty and hope and freedom and peace to their communities, and they enjoy the blessing of God, but then they forget God. And I found over the years that often we can forget God more in our joy than we can in our trauma. And God wants to be involved in everything. He wants us to trust him at all times. And something happened at those times when they forgot God. They didn't just leave him out. It says, and it repeats this phrase, the people did what they saw was right in their own eyes. The 19th century philosopher Nietzsche, he made a famous declaration that said, God is dead. That philosopher, that philosophy that God, has de God is dead, has driven so much of the philosophies that people, you and I, now grow up in in this world. Society feels, on the whole, that we need to move on in our knowledge. We have greater understanding than we ever had, and so we don't believe in fairy tales any longer. We don't believe that there's an imaginary friend in the sky that wants to befriend us. And society has taken very much that approach that we've outgrown the concept of God, that he was never alive, he was never real, he was never active, but now we know. Declaration that can be seen outworking itself in so many areas of life now. Our kids a taught, a God is dead philosophy in schools. Our media portrays a God is dead philosophy on our TV screens. So many parts of our society declare God is dead. And so, what happens is not that we live a life that's free from God, but we become God. And we do what's right in our own eyes. We become our own idols. We become the ones that demand the worship. And so, you know, it feels like in today's world you can't say anything without upsetting somebody because you're blaspheming their God because that's their view. That's their perspective. That's their hope. That's their, that's their high prize. That's who they are. And in this world where authenticity is manifest by the desire for people to allow the authentic them to come out. So, like we believe as a church, don't we, that we're called to be authentic? Yeah. Yeah. So right, yeah. We'll put a cue up with a little right answer. The answer is yes. We believe the church is called to be authentic. Yeah. We're called to be people that are not plastic. We don't pretend. But that we're real. And we, we inculcate God into the very every area of our life. That's authentic Christianity. We don't pretend. We don't gather together and say, everything's great, and I'm going to lift my hands because everything's great. Sometimes we come together and say, life is rubbish right now, but God is greater. Sometimes we hug one another, not because everything's great, but because we want to reach out to one another in our pain, in our suffering, in our difficulty, and remind each other that God is great. You know, authentic Christianity doesn't mean to say we, we pretend that there's no issues, there's no trauma, there's no difficulty. It means that we embrace God in the midst of it. But authenticity in today's world, it says this. What's, what's the authentic truth that's in you? Who do you say you are? Who do you feel that you are? 
And we have got a philosophy growing up in, in the world that we live where people, they feel their identity is something that the exterior is not synchronized with, and therefore they change their exterior in order to try and compute and synchronize with their interior. And you see, what's happening is that we live in a world where God is dead, but the God is now them. Yeah. What's right in their own eyes? And the Bible calls that pride. Pride is when we take the place of God. And you see that the reality of our identity, and we live in a world that has significant identity crisis today, and never has there been a time where as a result of God being dead in society, where we have more people who are not flourishing, but they are absolutely being wrecked in life. Our young people are growing up wrecked in life in their own self-image because the philosophies of be your own God do not work. Because that's not what we were designed to be. Because you don't find who you are by looking in and listening to your distorted inner voice. You find out who you are by looking to the designer of our lives and seeing who he says we are and then bringing our life in compatibility with him. That's how we know who we are. And there's going to come a moment in society when the world is going to recognize that it's screwed up a generation. Where it's wrecked a whole life because they have empowered people to be their own God. And we find who we are in Christ. And if we're going to offer hope to this world, we have to know who we are. And we have to know how to communicate with authenticity who others are. We live in a world just like the book of Judges. Do what's right in their own eyes. Some of the decisions that our young people are making around a whole host of things, around sexuality, transgender issues, a lot of them are coming from issues in their life that are saying, I feel this. And I have great compassion. Because this is what we've taught them. This is the world that's cultivated this. But can I ask, are people more at peace? Can I ask, is society happier? Can I ask, are stress levels going down? Jesus comes along. says, I will give you water where you'll never thirst again. My peace I give you, my peace I give you. This is not about us taking something seriously and growing up and maturing as believers. There's a generation at stake here. If we, if we go into our caves as a church, if we're so preoccupied in our own reputation, if we are preoccupied in having lots of friends, lots of blessings, by conforming to the things of this world and by fitting into the philosophy of we do what's right in our own eyes, it's not just the church that will suffer. There are millions of people at stake. Yeah. And the government doesn't have the answer. Dare I say it, there's some in the room. Psychologists, you don't have the answer. Right. Science, you don't have the answer. Jesus is the answer. And it takes the people of God to model a new wardrobe, to model clothes of humility, and say, this is not about us. Look who he has made us to be. Look what he's dressed us with. People get dressed in pride Say, it's my life, it's my choice, it's my future, it's my feelings, it's my dreams, it's my hopes, it's my wants, it's my desires, it's my rights. Don't you dare touch my, 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 blah, blah, blah. 
Proverbs 11 verse 2 says, pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Do you know, I don't just pray because I'm, I don't believe prayer earns some brownie points in heaven, and I don't believe that it's like a nectar card system where the more I pray, the more points I can get and spend in heaven. I don't believe that's what prayer is like. When I pray, I'm reminded of who I am. And I'm reminded of who I'm not. And prayer brings an adjustment in me that brings an authority. People of prayer have authority, not because they've earned more authority, but because they've given them the sense of space to stand, open the wardrobe, to place upon them a humility that says, I can't do this by myself, I need you, God. And they clothe themselves in humility through prayer. And their authority is heavenly, not earthly. If you want heavenly authority and you haven't got a prayer life, forget it. Not that God hasn't given you power, but you have got no idea how to use it. Prayer accesses the wardrobe to place ourselves with humility. Let me just quickly give you, and I'm going to race through this quickly, the clothing of pride. If you're wearing pride, let me tell you how some of it manifests and how it looks to others. Pride clothing grumbles because it's got a spirit of self-entitlement to it. Philippians 2 verse 14 says, do everything. Maybe, could we water that down, God? Could we say most things? Could we say half the things that we do in a day? Could we say certain days of the week, please, God? Can we have a few grumble days, please, God? Can we have some grumble moments? Can we start some grumble groups as well as life groups? Can we do this? Can we have one Sunday a month where we have a grumble Sunday? Do everything without grumbling. See, what grumbling is a manifestation of a pride that's in our hearts about our entitlement, this is our right, and how dare someone offend our entitlement. And that provokes grumbling. God's got better for you. See, the clothing of pride boasts as well as grumbles. It believes it needs recognition for its achievements and its accomplishments. But the Apostle Paul, who had many achievements, he said this in 2 Corinthians 10, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. When people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is to have the Lord commend them. That's the, that's the sound I want. Somebody said to me in the pandemic, it must be so difficult to keep everybody happy. I said, oh, I hadn't thought that was my job. I thought my job was to honor God and to hear what he wants to say. I, I don't think I've made any decision during the pandemic. I just thought, how do we keep everybody happy? How do we keep the conspiracy theorists happy? How do we keep those who are vulnerable happy? I, I've not thought about that once. I want to hear God's well done. And I tell you what, I might have made some mistakes during this pandemic, but I can know I can stand before God with a clean conscience, believing that I've done everything he's asked me to do. And that's the commendation that you want. And if you wear humility, it allows yourself to be postured to hear his voice not the voice of others. One of the manifestations of the clothing of pride is that we become judges. We elevate ourselves to be worthy of passing judgment on others. Sometimes, you know, people get called up for jury service. I know some Christians who think they're on jury service 24 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week. And it's ugly. It's ugly. It doesn't suit you. You weren't designed to be that. You weren't called. It's not your ministry. It's your anti-ministry. And not only is it your anti-ministry, but it's an anti-ministry that's driving missiles into other people. It's been ugly online over the last 18 months to see Christians falling out, judging one another. If I wasn't a Christian and I'd been seeing some Christians behave online, I think I wouldn't be interested in God. Yeah. And it's awful. And at the heart of it is Pride. Jesus saying in Matthew 7, says, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Remember that. There's mercy and there's forgiveness. But change your clothes. 
Pride it demands respect. It prioritizes how people see us more than how they see God. You know, in our branded driven day of church and our reputations and we want to get five-star reviews on Google and all of those sort of things about our reputation. We want the photographs to represent the church community effectively. We want the world to think well of us, but I want the world to think well of Jesus, not the church. And I want the world, I, I, need, I need to be less concerned about what people think about me and what they think about you. And I want them to be more concerned about seeing the glory of God come in this area, come on the southwest. And in fact, we need to die to our reputation in order to see Christ lifted. It has to happen. There's never been a time in any of the moves of God where it has been wholesale accepted by people. There's a stain that sometimes comes on those who step out in the purposes of God. There's a mark that comes on their life and people don't understand it. And they judge it. And if you're wearing pride, you'll be susceptible to that judging. Keep your heart, babe. Come on. You're the only person in the room who can say babe <laughs> when encourage me in preaching. And I love it. Thank you, beautiful. It's my wife, by the way, anybody not sure. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12. It says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. See, Paul was not concerned with people seeing his strength. He was concerned in seeing Christ in him. He said, so now I am glad, I'm glad to boast about my weakness. Maybe we need to put a little bit more of our weaknesses in our advertising. Tell the world about our mess a bit. Tell them about the things we get wrong. Because a lot of the time they think we holier than thou. They think we never get anything wrong and they can't join us because they're not good enough. Maybe they need to see our mess a bit more, eh? goes on to say, I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. In closing, I want to encourage us to clothe ourselves in Christ. It's a scene in the Lord of the Rings, one of the trilogies where he puts that cloak on and it makes him invisible. And I believe that there's a cloak of humility. As C.S. Lewis says, that it doesn't think less about us, but it thinks about ourselves less. It thinks about Christ prioritizing life. We want people to see Christ. And there are times we need to be hidden around that. Stop pushing for significance or prominence. Actually, I got that the wrong way around. Stop pushing for prominence. You know, John Maxwell, um, famous sort of leadership guru, he said that not everything that's significant is prominent. My, my nose... Is prominent, but I could probably live without it. But my heart, you can't see it. Hopefully you can sense it as I'm speaking, my metaphorical heart, but it's significant. Not everything is prominent, significant, not everything is significant is prominent. But if we're striving out of pride, if we're not cloaking ourselves in humility, we'll be striving to be seen, striving to be affirmed, striving to be thought well of. And humility cloaks ourselves with Christ and hides ourselves in him. Of course, the greatest example of humility is Jesus. Philippians 2, verses 3, it says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Verse 7 of chapter 2 of Philippians, talking of our Savior. Oh, our Savior. The King of glory chose us, not just as a simple exercise of pointing his finger, but chose us with his life. It says instead... He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Jesus is not asking 
anything of us that he's not modeling. And that clothing of humility looks good on you. As we pray now, I'm going to invite you to consider making a decision that because you're loved and chosen and called to be holy, because you must clothe yourselves, that this week you make a decision every moment of your day to wear humility. And let it frame your conversations. Let it frame your attitudes. Let it frame how you lean in and listen. Clothe yourselves in the humility that Christ places in your wardrobe. And I'm going to ask, as we close our eyes, that if you are going to make a decision this week, every day, to choose to take humility off the hanger and to put it on. That you respond in a physical way in just a moment by standing. And the reason I ask you to stand is not so I can see. It's so that you have a moment where you remember you made a decision that wasn't just in your mind. It was a decision that was backed up with your actions. And as you stand, it's symbolic that you're going to give your actions this week to clothe yourselves in humility.